Hello everyone, welcome back to Cove Club, the one show where we get to talk to all of the actors, actresses, directors, producers, sound mixers, and all sorts of people within the industry as a whole. Today we're in for a treat because this is the episode I think where Nick's going to pick on me the most because of my own personal attachment towards this talent. I hate you, Nicholas. <laughs> Um, it is Amanda Hufford. <laughs> hey there. Thanks so much for having me. So, uh, a lot of people just know this lovely lady is Clippy. I'm sadly one of those people that knew her that for a long time because pronouncing her last name is hard since English is still not my favorite language to speak. But, uh... Uh, uh, yes, for the record, absolutely. You said it just fine. Um, it, it's Amanda Hufford, so nothing tricky. I swear there there aren't like silent letters or pronunciations. Pretty straightforward. You're good. Okay, but before we get started, you want to give like people that I know you've been on a lot of stuff. But you want to give like the rundown of like five things you've been in that people might have heard you in. Not like all thirty thousand, just like five. I, oh gosh, um, recent things that I have been in, um, a lot of people probably know me from, um, I, oh wow, good job you, what do you do for a living? <laughs> Who knows? Um, right, okay, thank you, uh, Amanda, thank you. <laughs> things that are recent um i'm debuting in hannah apocalypse as uh the lead role hannah i also do a cameo in cybernautica as lucy i play my namesake character clippy in splintered caravan um you can hear me in uh quite a few video games coming out soon i have a video game where i play uh all currently all 12 of the characters called swapette um i'm in casa voices of the dusk where again i play like 10 different characters, um, all of which are listed. <laughs> so you can go find all of these things. I play Evelyn for Evelyn. Um, sweetie, sweet, sweet. I said five, not that. Yeah, well, five. you know what? This is what you get, okay? It took me a second to think. And now there are things. Have them. Oh my God. <laughs> Um, let's let's just you know let's just edit out that entire thing and start <laughs> over from scratch. Oh my god! <laughs> uh, knowing who's editing this again, I, I hate you, Nicholas. He's not gonna edit out anything. He's just gonna have the music in the background like a douche. Pro so. Probably, yeah, absolutely. That's good. No, that's great. Everyone, you know, it doesn't matter. Everyone knows that I'm a scatterbrain dork anyway, so it's not really a big deal. And yet, you're also one of the most sought out women across the globe. Oh my goodness, I don't know if I'd say that, but <laughs> thank you, question mark? <laughs> uh, anyway, me trying to uh, uh, throw my hat into the ring with Amanda's side. Uh, <laughs> It's time, of course, for everyone's favorite thing and for more material for Nick to just be like, I got you now, bitch. Um, we're just going to go down the list of the questions for the lovely Amanda here. Um, first questions first, because I didn't want to start off this whole thing with extra probing questions like when I made... One of the uh, Imperial leaders for, I think, Thailand cry? That was a weird day. Uh, uh, what? I've been doing interviews for a long time, honey. You never knew this. <laughs> I didn't know you made uh, uh, someone cry. I, I don't know if I'm emotionally prepared for apparently your very daunting list of questions. Oh no, I was just asking him how he felt about how his people were feeling mistreated by his whole entire regime of his dictatorship-like uh, appeal as a leader, along with how he treated his constituents for people that got him into power, and then he started crying because he didn't know how to answer. Oh yeah, sure, that old chestnut. Everyone's got the answer for that sitting in their back pocket. <laughs> Oh, God. I am a mess. Anyway. <laughs> the first question I have here is, what started your journey into 
voice acting in general? Um, so I'm a lifelong performer. I've been um, a vocalist and a performer with a background in stage and musical theater pretty much since I could walk and talk. Um, and I used to do stage work and teach theater to um, five to 17 year olds. Um, and at some point, someone saw a character uh, that I was doing on stage for one of the kids shows. I played this kind of snidely whiplash type villain, right? And uh, they liked the voice that I did and um, they wanted me to come do some voices for them. And that's just kind of how I fell into it. And then I kept falling into it and uh, snowballed into the giant mess of chaos on Twitter that you know and love or hate. I'm gonna go with the first one because you already know I can't hate you for many <laughs> reasons. Um, well, that's that's just the start of like the breezy quest. We're gonna just keep on building up on breezy and maybe hit you with some harder questions because I don't feel like being that kind of douchebag. Um, okay, okay. Second question I've kind of had written up for me because Nick hates me for this entire episode. If y'all can't tell why, just keep watching. Um, second question is, since you've been a part of like Writer's Code for a project before, what could you tell people about what it's kind of like to deal with? The I'm not reading the rest of this because it's just insulting me. Why would you write this, Nick? Why? Um, so, uh, you, you want to know what it's like working with writer's code. That's the question. That's what you're willing to read of the question. It's more like working with me as a director. He was saying a lot of stuff to have me embarrass myself. Nick, why? Well, please go, go ahead. I mean, if Nick wanted you to read it, I, I think inquiring minds want to know. It was, and I quote, could you tell people what it's like to work with a lovelorn, sick puppy dog that just grovels at your feet as a director. Uh, a, a thoroughly satisfying experience. Um, <laughs> the project we worked on previously actually happened in the middle of um, uh, a few personal conflicts. So um, I, I was given such wonderful accommodations and understanding treatment for my hectic schedule at the time and um nothing but polite and and courteous attitude i'm glad you feel that way i'm just still looking at this whole entire question like why would you make me read this <laughs> why would you I mean, make me read this technically nick didn't make you read it i just said you should so I guess you could be mad at me. I can't, and you know why. <laughs> uh, anyway, third question. <clears throat> um, so everyone knows like the enigmatic figure that is just the Clippy or the mm -hmm. other title that I can't say for Inquiring Minds. Um, oh my goodness. <laughs> but... Could you walk us through a day in the life of being Amanda, like away from the microphone for everyone at home? You know that gif of SpongeBob and Patrick running around screaming inside of SpongeBob's house? Kind of, yes. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, every day is different. I do, I, I do work with. Um, a lot of different types of projects and different creators. So there's a portion of time that is allocated to my own voice acting uh, projects where I am voicing, but then I also have projects that I am directing, um, projects that I'm helping manage, projects I'm casting for, um, vocal performances. Not so much since COVID, but I used to do a lot of live performances, but time is as time has gone on those are less and less <laughs> um so uh, things things of that nature really it's just um it's what's on my docket for the day and for for the week it cannot it, it changes so quickly and so frequently um yeah depending on if i'm 
I'm working from home or if I'm in the studio. It, I'd love, I would love to give you a standard breakdown, but there really just isn't one. <laughs> ah, well, honestly, that just kind of sounds like my life before COVID and now it's just, well, I'm my own boss. So do I need to talk to anyone? Nah, fam, I'm good. I'm just going to take like a three hour nap. <laughs> I wish that I, I could take a three hour nap. Normally when people are taking their nine hour nap, I'm um, awake recording. What is this nine hour nap you speak of? I only know three. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much how I feel. <laughs> uh, anyway, sad life aside. <laughs> Mine, not hers. <laughs> um, so... This is something that I kind of had people throw my way when I used to work with uh, PBS for a time. Terrible, terrible people, but nice enough environment. Um, what would you say is your favorite acting memory? Like out of any single experience that you've had, any project you've done, what is the number one memory that you hold most dear to you? Um, I think that there's no other answer I could give outside of Splintered Caravan, where Clippy comes from, and um, getting to grow and develop that character, getting to grow and develop with her, and getting to know the family, because really that show became a family, and it meant so much to all of us. I mean, so much so that it's still the name that I go by, um, and couldn't shake if I wanted to. That was beautiful, man. <laughs> huh. As I'm trying to keep an eye out for my pet, because usually at like five, he's here to try and claw up something. Anyway. Animals, man. Anyway. Uh, while Absolutely. I'm, while I'm now fully focused, because ADD is a terrible, terrible thing. Um... Question number five, I believe. It should be five. Yeah. Um, for the current climate of voice acting, where do you think people mostly view it as for newcomers? Like, do you think they view it as an easy job to get into? They think it's like a play-play thing that's just, you grab a mic and do whatever? Or do you think people are coming into it more seriously nowadays? I um, I don't know how big of a difference there is in mentality and attitude uh, surrounding voice acting for people who get into voice acting. Uh, there absolutely is um, a misjudgment on the difficulty and skill level required in order to voice act. It's very common for people who know nothing about acting at all, let alone voice acting, to go tell other people who know nothing about acting at all, let alone voice acting, that they should voice act, which um, is a bit of a strange thing to me. I, I don't know nearly as many professions that people constantly suggest to other humans when neither of them have any experience or background in it as much as I hear people suggest voice acting. And that's probably the most common background that I get for people who um, schedule time with me saying, well, people have been telling me my whole life that I've got a great voice and I should do voice acting. Um, so I, I think that there are some illusions about what voice acting entails. A lot of people don't realize that just like anything else, it is a skill that you need to develop and there's a focus on acting. You know, you could have a beautiful sounding voice, something that's very soothing to listen to. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be a fit for most of the genres of voice acting or have the skill or ability to put forth the performance required. Um, but that's not something that everybody figures out right away. Um, so. Yeah. Uh, th thank God, because I've been trying to have this debate with like, I don't know how many people, so many people are saying, they're coming in for better reasons. Like, I don't know, man. I keep hearing people saying, oh, they can do an Elmo. Well, that's great. Most five-year-olds can do Elmo. What else can they do? 
Uh, Im impressions are definitely something that people heavily focus on before they understand the full scope of voice acting. And don't get me wrong, impressions are a tool in your voice acting tool belt. I'm not particularly good at impressions. I don't have a lot of them. I'm not a perfect mimic. And I think that people who are, oh, wow, what a fantastic skill to have. But um, for, for some people who don't have uh, the background in voice acting, they don't necessarily realize that uh, what what makes an iconic character that someone could eventually impersonate later on to begin with uh, is an original sound. So you need to be able to have um, different aspects to your acting and different skills in your acting tool belt. Could not agree more. I'm just, just kind of tired of most people saying they got into acting for just impressions. I'm like, guys, I'm... I'm trying to look for people that can act too. It's like, but impressions are acting. That's just impersonations. I need acting with it too. Uh, I I'm sorry, dear. Were you going to say something? Oh, nope. <laughs> You're totally fine. Like I, I heard you like about to say something. I was like, I feel so bad. I should probably wait to see if she's going to say something. Oh, you're totally fine. That was probably just um, the sound of me sometimes occasionally taking in air as living things <laughs> do. <laughs> no, it's a strange, it's a strange thing. I just thought you were going to say something, not just going like this whole, <laughs> but you see what people folk do is they inject a breath. <laughs> Well, my darling, you you see, uh, it biological beings with with lung capacity at some point need to intake oxygen in order to continue functioning. <laughs> anyway, before I start cracking, and then Nick is just like, "I got you now, you son of a." Let's go into the next question. Um. Oh, oh, it's another Nick question. Yay. I am not a, I'm not a fan of one of my closest friends right now. It's, it's painfully obvious. <laughs> um, so this current question is for each side of the fence for all actors, whether it's for the safe work or not safe work field. And he's kind of underlining not safe for work and then drew a, a picture of me with the N right over my face. And I'm like, dude, why, why do this? Um, his main question was, where do you think the scope lies where it's more demeaning in the societal eyes to do not safe for work, but more acceptable to just purely be safe for work? I hate you, Nick. I'm not sure I fully understand his question. I, I don't get it, because I'm trying to explain it as best as he wrote it down, but I'm like, um... What? I think it's more like how certain people make fun or demean people that do the not safe for work stuff, but... You also hear them in safe for work. I I don't. I'm trying my best here with this question. So, uh, I'll just answer a question that I think might at least be close to what he's asking. Uh, I don't think that there's anything wrong with people who do not safe for work work. Full stop. Um, and there are different capacities that people uh, participate in not safe for work work. But when it comes down to it, um, you know, we're all just trying to make a living. And not safe for work performances are, it's all just sounds. They're all just lines and you're just a performer and you are there to convey a certain emotion, to evoke something of the audience, to get a scene across, to set place for a character. And it doesn't matter what that character's doing, whether they're doing something not safe for work or, you know, something more typical. Okay, cause I'm, I'm still just trying to reread it as if I didn't. Un no, I'm reading it exactly as he wrote it. I'm still just like, I, I don't understand. I, I really don't understand. Oh, uh, God. When you have two people that don't have English as their first language and they have to read each other's handwriting, it's terrible. 
Um, next question, and now it's back to one of my questions. Thank God. Um, what could you tell us about um, one of your more recent projects? Because everyone already knows, like you already have, like maybe. 300 different things already on your shelf of things to do but for one of them what could you tell people like it's like a, a small synopsis not giving away a lot of details but at least a synopsis of what it is for people to look forward to sure um i have well i already mentioned han apocalypse uh since that's probably the most recent thing since they dropped the trailer this week uh, I'd be happy to talk about that. Han Apocalypse is obviously a post-apocalyptic audio drama uh, where I play Hannah, the main character, who just happens to be a zombie. Um, she is very spunky. It's very tongue-in-cheek satire. And the writing is absolutely incredible. I'm working on it with Damien, who is um, the producer and writer behind Cybernautica. Uh, they are an incredibly talented, not only writer, but creator. Um, he puts so much into the projects that he works on. And truly, I cannot wait to show everyone the story and the adventure that Hannah goes on throughout this season. Okay. Uh, ooh, I'm, I'm just... Sorry, while you were talking, I was just kind of marking out all of the last two questions from Nick because I'm like, I can't keep looking at these things. Like, why, why is, <laughs> why is this the the day he decides to pick on me out of all days? Um, next question, and this is starting to get into the uh, heavier questions. Not probing, just heavier. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to ask this question the most out of every episode thus far, because it's a very odd thing of since I came back to the voice acting side of acting and seeing how the landscape changed a couple of years ago. But now currently with how the diversity has changed, how people are trying to look for more representation and whatnot... I'm just wondering from someone that has stuck with it longer than I did the first time, where do you see the landscape reshaping in the upcoming five to 10 years with how people are looking for better representation, better things of people of color, of diff different credences over just getting someone that they feel like just blankly fits a token role? I don't think that's something that I can fairly or accurately predict. I will say that I think important conversations are being had, probably not as loudly or as frequently as they should be. Um, but I do think that people are paying more attention than they have ever have previously. Um, I, I do think that representation in every facet of media is important. And a lot of people take for granted that with voice acting, because you don't see somebody, that that means <laughs> that representation doesn't matter. Um, without understanding that what they're saying is that representation of a particular life experience doesn't matter, right? Um, just because a character is drawn a certain ethnicity doesn't mean that any voice actor is capable of playing that character just because you don't see the voice actor themselves. It, it all goes back to life experience, right? You know, to know what it's like to grow up and, and live in America or in other countries as a certain ethnicity or a certain gender or a certain sexual orientation or a certain religion. All of these things shape who we are as humans. As actors, we do our best to portray individuals that we are not, right? But there, there's a certain amount of life experience that your research isn't just, it, it just isn't going to expose you to, right? No matter how much you try, if you are raised as a certain individual, you are only going to be relate. You're only going to be able to relate to a certain extent to someone else's life experience. And um, I think when people are having that argument of what actors should do versus what they should be able to do, 
a lot of people aren't taking into consideration. You know, you could be an incredible actor and maybe you will give an incredible performance for this character. That's great. But is that more important? And should that overshadow having someone authentically represent what that character's life experience has been or could be? And um, for me personally, I think representation is more important. And it's not that you won't get a fantastic performance from somebody who's able to authentically represent that character. You will. Those actors are out there. And more often than not, they're not being given the opportunities that they deserve. They're either being cast solely as background tokens and never given the main character role, or um, they have characters who are written and developed for them solely to tell a representative story, which is also very burdensome to not be able to play a character that isn't focused around, you know, the issue of race or religion or sexual identity. To want to just be able to play a character to play a character and not have to be that representative token. That's, it, it's, a, it's a difficult line that uh, actors of color are having to walk right now. And a lot of people, I think selfishly aren't open to the conversation because they're really only focused on keeping as many roles open to them personally as possible. And I just don't think that that should be the focus. Um, so where all these conversations are going to take us five years from now, I don't know, but I hope it's somewhere better. And um, that's something that I will continue to try to focus on personally. Uh, so, I'm sorry, y'all. Um, completely honest, I felt like my heart skipped a beat for like a split second there. Um, <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Nick, you have one, okay? You have one. I, I don't want to hear anything about it on Twitter, though. Um... <laughs> I'm so sorry. I hope my, my what, five-minute-long rambling on this subject wasn't, uh, <laughs> wasn't to your detriment? <laughs> no, no, it's not a detriment thing. It's for... Well, you, you know. You know, Clippy. Y you know, but... Nick wanted this to be like the whole thing of just like, if he can get one thing where I, the lion founder, could be caught crushing hard on you, he'd clown on me about it the next 10 years. Um, and I understand. Moving on, since I already embarrassed myself. Um, <laughs> the next big thing is a questionnaire I kind of remembered from a guy I used to know at NBC. Um, what could you tell tell everyone would be the dream role you'd want? Like it could be of any any big scale for television, for movie, for a video game, whatever that dream role is. What would it be and why? My biggest acting inspiration, not just voice acting specific, but acting in general, is uh, Jennifer Hale, and specifically her performance as uh, the female Shepherd in Mass Effect. It's my favorite game. Yes, I said game singular. I count all of them together because you can't make me choose. Um, I, I just fell in love with the story, with the character, and specifically her performance. I feel like you get a, a far more nuanced character when you play as Femshep and you have Jennifer Hale there guiding you through all of those games. Um, and it would be my dream to be able to play a character of that importance on that kind of scale in a medium that I love. I'm very passionate about, about games in every genre, in every capacity. It's something that I have always loved um, and loved working with and connecting with other creators who enjoy being involved. Uh, so that that's something, that would be my kind of feather in my cap for my career to be able to be involved in a game that touches people the way that mass effect touched me i get it mostly because i had no life to bunch of mass effect for a lot of very very odd reasons mostly for uh therapeutic things of just shooting mercs <laughs> I, I can't explain it. It's just when you pop in that game, you're just like enemy mercs and just enemy targets. It's like, okay, I'm just going to imagine this is my day. <laughs> I feel like the game has um, very good immersion. And so that's 
one of the reasons you're able to lose yourself so well in it. Except for Andromeda. Moving on! Yeah, let's not talk about <laughs> uh, So, this next question is something I tried asking a uh, Christian O'Boyle in his episode, which honestly, I, I'm starting to now realize I really talk to a lot of very interesting people in this show. Very, very odd how I keep getting the luck like this. <laughs> um, now, this is going to be a question that's not really a slight or trying to egg on anyone. I ask this as like a purely non-biased thing, as someone that has to look at actors every day for a lot of different positions and say who's the best fit for what. But mm -hmm. you... Amanda, as a fellow actor of multiple fields, have interacted with a menagerie of people. You've seen the landscape on a much more personal standpoint than I ever could, because I'm kind of an a-hole. Um, but who would you see currently as being that next upcoming star that's going to just break the mold for people, in your own honest opinion? It could be any one of them, honey. I mean that truly. The the things that I have seen from the creators I've connected with, uh, especially on Twitter, gosh, it, it just blows me away. These people are so driven and so talented and so passionate. They truly inspire me. I, um, I, I physically couldn't pick one because I, I would have to list them all. And I... I mean it when I say I am so excited to see where all of these people go and the things that they create. This is this is why I'm a creator. I love how much these people put of themselves into the work that they do. And it reflects. It's um it's really beautiful to be involved in that and to know any of them in any capacity. I I think any one of them could break not only the next mold, but the mold after that, and then the mold after that, and keep pushing each other. Sorry, sorry, I was, I was getting all misty-eyed, because that's one of the most beautiful things I've heard. Oh, gosh. <laughs> there are people that are too good for this world, and this is one of them. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Why won't you let me love you? Anyway. Oh, I don't want to feel good. I want to feel evil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving on. Uh, oh, there's there's a handful of questions left and i'm just at that point where i'm i'm getting all misty eyed where i'm like can i keep reading right now or do i need a minute so i'm going to do this little bit or i'm doing this early y'all i don't usually do this as an early segment but because amanda has such a way with words to make my own eyes all misty and my heart skip a beat i'm gonna flip the tables and y'all already know the song and dance now it's the guest turn to ask the interviewee because in, in all honest opinions, from everything I've done for journalism, everyone has questions they need to have answered. No one's exempt from the rules. So why not have everyone get asked some questions? Uh, all right. Um, well, then I would have to ask you, um, what started your writing journey? Um, do you want the honest version or the version that's safe for all ears to listen to? Uh, well, that's up to you. It's your show to air, isn't it? I mean, for me, I could say either or, but people are just like, man, I, I don't know if you could really say that story. It's like, eh, people gotta know eventually. Screw it. <laughs> Whatever you're comfortable with. All right. So, um, we gonna rewind the clock back to when I was around five. 
Um, I remember I was with these two two people where anyone that knows when a person love when I talk about the years of one through eight, they're not really good years for many reasons I can't say in any interview show to save my life. Privately, I'll talk about it, but not in any recording. Anyway, I was five and my grandparents got me the premium edition comic book line straight from Stan Lee. I don't know how they did it, but it was like first editions all signed by Stan Lee from the Silver Age of Comics. And I opened up my first thing to be of the Fantastic Four. And from there, I made my first ever OCs, which would be Mama Ocean. Then a couple months later, I made Her Children, where it was just like a very cutesy thing, where before I became the master of dark stories that kind of have very odd implications of like spouses being kidnapped and people getting impaled. It was mostly just like these family figures are saving the world with their superpowers. And I kind of expand on that whole lore where when I was around 10 was when the darker aspects of my mind kicked in where I made my first OC. Uh, I can't really say the name because if I do, y'all are going to find out who I am. But that OC kind of started the whole thing where I made my first official mafia story where it was this guy that was cursed by several different witches where his facial appearance changed but his ruthlessness grew as he did an all-out war of humans versus witches which went through an entire thing of like three different short stories and one novel all unpublished because i don't want people to read those writings which then elevated when i was around 14 and then i was talking to one of my comic book loving friends who to this day is now making his own web comic I don't know if it's out yet or not, but it's pretty decent, where he allowed me to do the manga series that started the series that I've made recently, Let's Do Art, Lost Tides, Hollow Sands, um, Before the Fallen, all those series and more were just elaborated on after those mangas for like several different volumes, all written and illustrated by myself and by my friends. And then from there, I made my own short stories, a few of which got in some newspapers here and there. I made a couple of uh, wedding vow things for people within my stories when I was around 16. Then when I was 17, I kind of wrote an entire romance novel for my then fiance at the time where she gave it to some of her friends where I sold the rights to them. I don't know if they got published, but I made $800 off of just writing five books. And I did kind of make a couple of TV pilots where one got stolen by Fox, which became a joke on Family Guy, which still makes me angry at Fox, but we're not going to go there ever again. And here we are now at several, several long years. <laughs> That is quite the tale. That that's that is a lot to unpack. Um, so you said you had one of your works stolen by Fox. Are you at liberty to speak about that? I made a series where the pilot was about this kid that was in his senior year of college, but everyone just kind of noticed that he went from this partying frat boy to being this guy that was doing well in school, trying to get his grades up. And all of his friends are kind of wondering because him and his girlfriend weren't seen after the summer break. And one of his friends tracked him down to his apartment to find out that he had a baby girl and that his girlfriend died in childbirth. When I was trying to give the pilot away, though, I also gave up a lot of money to people about how to get it done. But... I then find out years later from one of my friends who was watching Family at the time that Brian wrote this thing of this guy going back to college for his daughter and then all of a sudden they had this whole James Wood element and I'm like, that literally sounds like my pilot that was stolen from that producer. Wow, that is heartbreaking. I can't imagine. I, I know that... Um... 
IP theft is very frequent, especially among small creators versus big companies. I'm so sorry that happened to you. Eh, it's fine. I'll, I'll make the show again someday. I don't know when, but someday. <laughs> so, branching off from writing, how did you get into voice acting? This is honestly my favorite thing, because this is the third story. Let's go. So... I'm nine years old with my buddy Julian. He and I are just screwing around at his mom's job where she used to work for advertisement firms to kind of help out with people to get production done for their products. There's this guy who's just trying to film this commercial for a diaper product that was trying to get all the way to battle Huggies in the diaper market. It was gonna be the next big Huggies, even though after three weeks of testing, the babies got rashes and they had to discontinue it before it went public. Um, the problem though with the commercial was that the baby actor they got would not react, would not cry. It would just stare blankly and they didn't know at the time that sound effects were a thing. I figured that'd be kind of obvious. So, Julian's mom is kind of scrambling because she already had a contract with these people for about 1.6 million dollars. She did not want to lose this account because whether they win or lose, they still got the 1.6 million dollars. So she overhears me and my buddy Julian just going off and off with some baby noises because we were just like, oh look a little baby! And I'm just trying to impersonate a baby and then she's just saying, could you get in front of a makeshift microphone and do the exact same thing? And I'm, me at nine years old, I'm just like, what? And she just drags me. I do some sound effects where they just try to get an upset baby to dub over later on that day, I think. I don't know. I didn't watch the stupid commercial. All I got was $500 at nine years old. I didn't know what else to do. Although I had to find out later that's kind of against child labor laws since I had no guardianship around me. And it was kind of illegal, but I'll let that go. Because to balance out that illegal stuff, I had an agent at the time I was like 13 years old where he had me do some under the table work with NBC and PBS. Again, very illegal. I do not recommend that for anyone trying to get in the industry because that's how you don't get credited even if you get bigger paychecks than people on IMDb pages. I'm gonna say less about that though. Where they've had me in projects for Law and Order and for Cyber Chaser, some shit like that. And at the same time, some kid in India was trying to pay me for something that I didn't even know was gonna be my favorite project to do at all. He just hits me up when I'm with my then girlfriend and I'm just sending him the lines of my Cape of Wonders voice because I'm a huge Frank Welker student. Um, and from all that sort of stuff, when I was around 15, about to turn 16, my agent at the time was trying to bring me in to do what was eventually going to be Netflix projects, but then I remembered how much money he stole from me, and now he was trying to negotiate to get 95% of my income from me, and I was like, nah because I was now a father, I couldn't do this whole bullshit acting, and I wanted to just be a normal guy, even though what I did at the time is not normal. So from there, I kind of just didn't really act, act. I kind of was in a few things in the international markets for one of my friends when they did fashion line stuff in Europe. I did a few things for some people where for a YouTube channel, I actually read all of Mephistopheles' um, biggest uh, soliloquy all in Arabic for about two hours straight. And from there, I didn't really act act until I met up with Jordan Rudolph, love you Jordan, where if it weren't for her, I wouldn't have come back to voice acting to begin with, where I've made my own company, made my own uh, projects, and now I'm in a bunch of other stuff that I can't talk about because NDAs. Wow, you truly have gone through quite a lot in the creative community, haven't you? I guess, I don't know. <laughs> Well, that's fantastic. I mean, I'm certainly glad that you came back to voice acting. At least someone is. 
<laughs> well, you've been nothing but a pleasure to work with for me personally. So I've I, I have had a very positive experience on the project that we worked together on in the past. If y'all could actually see my face, which is impossible, I'm kind of blushing right now. <laughs> <laughs> well gosh that's uh those those are the questions that i was curious about do you have anything else for me before uh before we hit the end of this oh honey you know i got non-stop questions but i gotta limit it to a number oh okay okay so we're gonna unflip the table and then get straight back to this because i'm no longer misty eyed <laughs> <laughs> so from all of these current projects that you're in for these audio dramas, these visual novels, these video games, what what really is left for you to do that you haven't done yet? Because everyone's like, if I reach this one peak, I can say I'm done. Or if I reach that peak, I think I'm good doing whatever it is I want. Everyone has that different argument, but what's your argument statement for it. I'm never done. I, I don't have a done. I don't have a peak. This is what I love to do. And I will continue doing it in whatever form and capacity is available to me in, in my lifetime. I love acting. I love directing. I love working with other creators. And um, every project that I've been fortunate enough to be a part of has brought something truly positive and beautiful to my life. Um, there's, there's no cap to that. I hope I never reach one. I hope you don't either, because I could listen to your voice forever. <laughs> Wait, that just gave Nick two. Damn it! Um, why do I do this to myself? Um, let me just find the next question before I kind of just grovel. Uh, there we go. This is a very odd question, but I kind of feel like asking this since everyone has that one question in the back of their minds. How much fan fiction, fan fiction do you think people have written about you in general with any cohort or creative in your entire career? Fan fiction about me? Uh, I... I'm going to go out on a limb and say none. I'm going to go out on a limb and say there is no fan fiction of me. <laughs> I mean, you'd be surprised because some people are like, there is no fan fiction of this person. It's like, I don't know, fam. I feel like there's like one person out there writing up an entire Titanic length fan fiction that we don't even know about. So who Unless knows? you're that person and you're trying to tell me you've written fan fiction, I don't think it exists. Amanda, when would I have time to write fan fiction? <laughs> like, when would I have the time? Fan art, maybe. Maybe. But we already talked about that other fan, yeah. fan art I'm doing. But fan mm -hmm. fiction! <laughs> who has the yeah. time? It takes a lot of time and dedication. I don't know. I, uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay, but uh, if you find it, I will literally have Nick be like in the, in the whole comment section on the YouTube and maybe me being on the Spotify just being like, yeah, we, we found some fan fiction. We're going to do if a live reading. Fan, if you find some fan fiction, you let me know and I 100% will do a dramatic reading of <laughs> fan fiction of me. You let me know. I will, I will make the time. <laughs> Uh, as I just automatically hear like every potential suitor being like fan fiction read by <laughs> oh. Clippy must oh, go to my computer. <laughs> uh, what is wrong with me? Moving on. Uh, hmm. Looks like we're looks like we're declining into some uh, breezy questions again. This is nice. This is nice. Okay. 
Um, what would you... Now, this is probably just gonna be me being like, I hope it's... I hope the answer isn't me. Um, what would you say is the one project that you had the biggest difficulty wrapping your mind around? Wrapping my mind around? Um... You know, normally if there are red flags, I pass on the project, honestly. I try to be very specific and intentional with the work that I accept onto my plate because I do have such a busy and hectic schedule and I am split between so many different capacities. Um, everything that, you know, that I am currently working on has for the most part been a, a positive experience. There are always uh, miscommunications or stressors or deadline issues or content changes, um, but nothing that I would ever that I would ever say needs to be publicly spoken about, you know, it's just the normal things that occur in a project. But, um, I stand by all of the projects that I'm involved with. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Cause I was like, I hope the answer isn't me. Cause I tried so hard <laughs> on a very, very tight no, deadline no, for not. myself. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I don't know if you guys know this for Writer's Cove related stuff, but I have to write at least four for four different shows at a time and mini sods at the same capacity, so it's hard. <laughs> oh god. Uh So I was just like I really hope that Clippy didn't think that being an ifrit slash fire gin wasn't like too hard to wrap her mind around because I was like, please, please let it not be me. Please let it not be me. <laughs> no, like I said, I had nothing but a positive experience working on your project. I'm glad you're saying that because we might bring you back in for something else. <clears throat> I would be more than happy to work with you on anything you want in the future, darling. Next question. As I'm trying to keep myself together. Uh, <laughs> uh, Y'all don't know how hard it is to kind of just do something with one of your professional crushes in an interview. It's just one of the most damning things. Gosh. <laughs> uh, so, for... A lot of people, they, like Lance, for example, they can't really wrap their mind around when I ask them this question for unknown reasons on a personal level, but how do you feel about being a couple of people's inspiration for getting into the acting field? I... I it is an honor is the only thing that I could say. That anything that I have done has been of benefit to anyone around me. Um, that's certainly, it's certainly a goal, right? I want to be able to support and encourage other creators to just keep putting their work out there. That's what matters to me. So if anything I've done has been of benefit, that's, I mean, it's truly an honor and um, I'm humbled by the experience and all of the beautiful people that I have met. Uh, and it makes me laugh. Some of the people who tell me that I inspired them and gosh, I'm just looking at their work and thinking how, how, how did I inspire that masterpiece? No, that was inside you all the time. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> Maybe the inspiration was the friends we made along the way. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as I just pulled that meme right out of my spinal column. Don't you mean you're behind? No, my spinal column, because it's October. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, speaking of which, this is probably going to be the only question I ask for anyone in the October range as we're recording this, but for any monster related role that you could imagine yourself doing. It could be something you're thinking off the top of your head. Zombies. Honey, let zombies. me finish. 
Zombies. Honey. The answer is zombies. <laughs> Honey, let me finish. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Jeez. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. And something that you're not currently being. If you'd let me finish. <laughs> What do you think you'd be the most excited to see yourself being for in a film? A zombie. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, there is no other answer to that question. I love zombies. I'm obsessed with zombies. I have always loved zombies, like from a creepy young age. Like it probably was weird. Um, uh, I don't know why. I just find them really fun and engaging and uh they're my perfect brand of horror i love zombies i mean zombies are just normal people after just going several days without sleep and with no coffee they're just like uh... yeah but it's it's an opportunity to explore such a a range and depth of the human experience which I sounds so pretentious but i agree I... <laughs> but it's basically just the person without any coffee and no sleep just like must get juice what what's wrong with him you know he's been working like 22 hours a day he's got to be in like 13 different things every day he's only got like two hours of sleep need coffee brains see he's fine yeah, I don't know. I there's there's a lot of interesting opportunity for you know horror aspects. I love the physical bits and gags. Um, you know, the bloodier the better. Uh, I'm I'm listening. I'm I'm just now thinking of making a comedy skit where it's just a normal person they mistake as a zombie, and yet the real zombie's right in front of them. That sounds pretty funny. I mean, I, I might do that next year because we already have a Hall two Halloween specials this year. My God. Uh, do I ever stop working? No, no, I don't. I know that feeling well. So, I think these are the final three questions, which is, thank God. Not because I'm not enjoying this, but because I know Nick's just going to have a field day listening to all these and editing these. Uh, one of these days. Moving <laughs> on. Um, so the next question I have on tap is... Probably gonna be the most interesting one since my uh, last last episode with a uh, Miss Su Ling Chan. What genre in fiction is like your least favorite to tackle into? Least favorite? Um, I'm gonna be honest. I don't know if I have a least favorite. I. You know, I quite enjoy fiction in all capacities. I love, I, I'm a big uh, sci-fi person. I love sci-fi. Fantasy's good too. I like historical fiction. Um, uh, I think, I think it's less about a fiction genre and more about the story. You know, sometimes people have a focus or themes that I think are outdated or I think just don't hit the audience as well. Um, and sometimes those are, are less fun to work on, right? It's difficult to get yourself enthusiastic about a project when when you feel like the theme of the story just doesn't speak to you. Uh, but in general, I mean, you know, I'm I'm an eclectic individual. I like a little bit of everything. You're a better person than me because I kind of hate romantic fiction so much. I mean, you know, it really just depends. It's all about the story. If if you are a good a good writer and you have a good story to tell, I'm there to listen to it. Again, you you're better than me because if I have to hear more stuff of like there once was this fisherman that came to our island with his rippled biceps and his tight blouse as his hair flew into the wind, it's like could could y'all just not like, could y'all not please? 
I, I didn't sign up for this. The cover made it look like someone was going to get stabbed. Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> like, this man literally looked like he was going to kidnap you and, and stab your husband in the chest. What is this? Ooh, the graphic. <laughs> I mean, I've already seen so many people being like... Okay, so the prince is going to hug the maiden? Yeah. He's gonna look dead into her eyes? Yeah. Then he's gonna have his crew kidnap her as he shoots the husband in the leg and then says, bring me five different treasures full of gold. What? Uh, that, yeah, that's, I mean, that's an odd setup. I mean, it was a good enough short film that got someone an A-plus in their college cr credit stuff, so I was like, well, I'm on board. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Uh, my hatred for the romantic genre aside. But Lion Founder, you have written romance. That's more of a subplot than an actual genre focus. <laughs> uh, the next to last question I have is. Wait, hold on. Got a little bit of ketchup on one of the letters. I think it was having fries when I was writing these. <laughs> uh, will me and my foodie ways ever stop? The answer is no. Um, <laughs> so this question is just... Hmm... How to phrase this, because it's hard to phrase it without sounding like it's a weird, pretentious question. It's not, it just sounds it. Um, when you finally reach that whole big pinnacle that people would be like, your name is synonymous everywhere, you're on every billboard, every television screen, every silver screen, every stage performance, what do you think will be that one role that people say you're best known for this? Like, bar none, nothing else. Just that is like the peak role people will remember you for the rest of your career. I don't know. Uh, it's really hard to say. You, you don't get to decide those things, you know? The audience does. For all I know, I haven't even gotten that role yet. That's fair. And again, guys, I wasn't trying to make it seem like a pretentious question. It's just a very big question everyone is wondering. Like, Sebastian Todd, he's mostly remembered for a Minecraft roleplay, hates it, and wants to be remembered for something else. Um, a few other friends of mine have been known for other roles, but they want to be known for something else. So it's, it's a big question. It's not meant to be pretentious, just very important in, like, everyone else's mind about what do they think they'll be remembered for. Absolutely. Uh, I, <laughs> Ever get those moments where your brain is just a little bit fried? <laughs> yes, I completely understand. Okay, so this is the final question, and it is apparently a two-part question. Are you ready? I am very ready. Hooray! Um, so the first half of this question is... Would you see yourself ever taking the position of starting your own... Uh, entertainment label of sorts to produce your own stuff on your own accord? I actually am already working on producing my own things. I've been um, quietly working on something for the last year or so with my team and we're in beta phase right now. It's going very well. I'm very I'm very proud of everything that we've put together, and I can't wait to show everybody. Huh, I kind of figured that'd be the thing. Nick, you owe me 25 bucks. <laughs> and the second half of this question for being in contrast to this, what could, what could you tell everyone would be the main formats that you're looking forward to producing? as 
a writer, director, producer, blah, 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 blah. I don't know that I have um, anything limited format wise. Um, I'd be open to anything. I do a lot of project management for a lot of different types of projects. You know, I work with audio dramas, visual novels, video games, animation. Um, it's, it's just kind of whatever happens. It, when I was talking about genres, you know, I care more about the individual project. I care more about that story than I do about um, a genre of potential stories. Uh, I always love a good maverick. <laughs> but uh, that is all of the questions I am going to permit myself to ask. If y'all want to know, I actually have at least two billion questions for Clippy alone, but I can't keep her all day. Oh, gosh. Well, uh, thank you so much for having me. It's been absolutely a pleasure. Uh, I hope... I was able to answer uh, the questions you did ask to, <laughs> to your satisfaction. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, guys, as the whole closing thing, since surprisingly this isn't going to be the longest episode, thank God, I've, thank God I'm limiting. And, Nick, you only get two, not five. Again, you owe me another 25 bucks. Um, if you guys want to keep up to date with all the stuff that, uh, Amanda Hufford is up to, all the stuff for our YouTube is in the description below, for all the things that you need to keep up date with all of her amazing exploits, and keep on the lookout for all their stuff she might be doing with us in the near future, because we might be looking to have her being not only an additional cast member for something, but a casting director for an upcoming project that we already have lined up in the woodworks not going to give any information away though so shh other than that though guys if you also want to keep up to all the stuff that we're doing our socials again for our youtube is in the description below as well as just our whole entire thing you're going to watch is away from being professional ish we also have our twitch account where we do a bunch of stuff monday through sunday every different stream is different and we like to keep up to date with all that stuff and if you want to help finance it so we can give our Whole entire cast and crew giant paychecks. We also have our Patreon and our Kofi again in the YouTube description below. And with all that stuff said and done, guys, I'm probably going to go in my shame closet because I feel like I've made a fool of myself in front of Amanda. Um, yeah, I am Vin the Lion Founder, and you guys take care.